Psyche is our fifth exhibition. And Science Gallery Bengaluru, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, is a public institution for research-based engagement. Today, we will be hearing Pat Marius talk about Towards a Museum in Psychiatry. Pat Marius has been working in the Dr. Giesler Museum since 2007, first as a project leader in scientific collaboration, later as a curator of numerous exhibitions in Ghent and abroad. Since 2019, he has served as an artistic director of the museum where he combines his interest in psychiatry and art history. Do not forget our upcoming programs. We have Brain Freeze, which is a quiz, uh, which is a quiz on the psyche tomorrow, led by Tejas Viodupa at 2 p.m. Um, from over here, a film discussion with filmmaker Patrick Burr and psychologist Dane Isaacs at 5 p.m. And a public lecture continuing in this series by Sanjeev Jain called Hysteria, the Complex and Convoluted Persistence of an Idea. Do send us your questions if you're on Facebook Live uh, through there or in the Q&A box if you are on uh, our Zoom link. And of course, do not forget to give us your feedback. So over to you, Bart. Hello and welcome again. After the, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, yes. Because after the earlier session, I will try now to focus on the museum itself. Uh, reason is that we have two quite different collections with uh, different rationals and a very specific history. Some things mingle and other parts of the history are so far away of each other. I want to take you on a journey through the history of psychiatry, the history of the so-called outsider art. And afterwards, I hope I have a bit time to add some closing remarks on how we think a museum on psychiatry must or can evolve. But first of all, how does a history of museum I will not bore you on an event called uh, Psyche with the history of museums, of course, but it is important to understand and to have a quick look at what a museum is in the mind of the West. And of course, the museum itself is a colonial concept and also psychiatry has a bit of a paternalistic history. That is why I think it is important to see where museums come from. Within the world of museums, then a museum on psychiatry is quite a new idea since the 1980s. Before that time, madness wasn't really something that fascinated people, collectors or potential visitors of museums. In first place, the museum was a place to show off. Uh, museum is of course a Roman word, and we know from excavations in the south of Europe that there were already places where the rich gave place to a sort of collection or personal inspira inspirations. After the Roman Empire, it took a while before collecting beautiful things became again an interest for the rich classes in Western culture. From the 16th century, this collecting returned and they existed from special goods, as you can see, from exotic countries, art such as statues or paintings. Collecting became very in. It became so hip that in Flemish, Flemish painting, it was a real genre for painters. And this is an example of a uh, something called a Kunstkammer. There was a difference between the Wunderkammer and the Kunstkammer. The first was mainly for exotic goods and specimens from several countries. The second, the Kunstkammer, was an example of the interest of collectors to show their art collection. The Franz Frankens were painters of several generations, so sons of sons of sons. So you have Franz Franken the first, the second, the third, and even the fourth. They made this genre specific for the Flemish painting schools. These paintings were made on commission for rich traders from Antwerp, Bruges or Brussels, and they gave an insight in the interest of these collectors. You see a lot of paintings, of course, a lot inspired by Christianity, important because these collectors had to show they were real and they were good Catholics. And some of these Kunstkammers are the only remembrance of paintings that got lost for example, the fam famous lost painting of Rubens, we only know by an example of these collection painted, paintings. Second, you see the interest in the Roman and the Greek culture. 
Of course, there has been a romantic idea of the lost antique world among thinkers, painters, etc. since the Renaissance. Schoen Museum in the UK is an example of the interest in these antique art artifacts. This museum was a personal collection of Sir John Schoen, an English architect of neoclassicism and one that was inspired by his own collection. In the 19th century, museums of fine arts popped up everywhere in Europe and they had the importance of catalogues or categories of paintings and statues. Some used the categories of schools or of centuries. For example, you had the Flemish painting, you have the Dutch uh, school in the Golden Age or the Italian Renaissance. In the mid of the 20th century, that was the start of the White Cube. This is not a place for history. What counted was the impact of the art. Central thought became museums and how people perceive them. White Cube suited uh, abstract expressionism or conceptual art, for example. And how can a museum on psychiatry fit in one of these simple categories? First of all, we can think of a museum with a historical line. And then, of course, we have to go through the history of psychiatry and tell all possible ways how madness was seen or how practitioners of medicine used the art of healing on their patients. But isn't that the paternalistic turn I talked about earlier? That is the problem we saw in our museum. Our collection grew enormously last years, but all of these collecting items, electroshock uh, equipment, books, insulin cure, baths, bath therapy, uh, are more a reflection of an institute that has power over the powerlessness. A second way that we will explore in short is thinking of a museum of psychiatry as a place where the patient can be destigmatized. A monument like ours where the patient through his own art can be rehabilitated. That will be the second or the parallel universe we will walk through. But first thing first, the history of, a, as you see, a critical psychiatry. I will not give you a lecture on the history of psychiatry because that would lead us too far away. I just try to bring some thinkers, philosophers, psychiatrists, psychologists and alienists together to search a critical psychiatry where the medical power was under pressure and where the powerful people tried to give voice to the powerlessness inmates. And therefore, I start with our unique ins inspirator in Ghent, Josef Giesler. Died in 1860, unmarried, had no children, except his own man in the Giesler Asylum. Fact that there uh, already exists a picture of Giesler, like the one you see, because he died in uh, 1860, tells us that, what, uh, that he was seen as an important and an innovative, innovative professor at a young university. In this portrait, Giesler was a man with a fine taste, not only in how he is standing in the picture, but also in the clothes he wears. Giesler made it possible, as I really told in the event, that the first psychiatric hospital of Belgium was erected in Ghent, then far from the city, uh, the center city. He even made it possible for himself to stay and to sleep in the asylum if it was, been, it's, it was necessary. The house where he lived with his mother until her and his death was located in the center. Gisela made his steps in local politics to become able to build his dream, the asylum. And he was also together with a tight member of the civil state involved in the first law for people with psychiatric problems. This law was important until 1996 in a form. This shows how foreseen and how revolutionary his thoughts were. He was really the liberator of the locked up insane. But Ghislain did not only made a law, he did not only set up a building, he was also a professor at the university. And in his lessons, he gave expression of his intent, inventions to cure these uncurable. This is an invention of Ghislain and was quite famous in the international psychiatric movement and it was called the rotation therapy. The idea was uh, quite simple, that by rotating a patient, all the bad emotional connections uh, could be unconnected and the psychiatric institute could make it possible to reconnect the emotional networks. 
This is, of course, a very oversimplified explanation, but it was the central idea of this um, therapy. Another idea was this Chinese bridge. A patient, as you can see, was walking through the hospital with a guard. Uh, there were no nurses at that time. And when they arrived at this beautiful spot, of course, the patient, he could step over the... Um, he could step over uh, first, over the bridge. Once he comes in the middle, there is a cage and there is a second guard behind the tree in the right part of the picture. He turns over the handle and the patient gets imprisoned in the cage and the cage falls in the cold water. The fright the patient overcomes was the initial thing Gislain wanted to arrive to. This fright, a fear of losing his life and drawing in the water, is a way to evoke an extreme emotional state. And this extreme state would make it possible to work further on the emotional instability of the patient. It looked like uh, Gislain was more of a torturer than a, a caregiver, but between the lines of his lessons and in the small details of his biography, we can see Gislain as a pioneer in psychotherapy. Although he doesn't make it a central idea in this theory, talking and listening to patients was seen very important for him. These two medical inspired, inspired uh, therapies, the rotation and the shock therapy, was a way to make him able to be taken serious by the medical world. At that time, and even much longer, psychiatry wasn't the best way to make a career in medical science, and Gislain, he tried to give the Belgian psychiatry a rational underground. Historically, it is also important to see Gislain as the go-between of the French and the German-speaking medical world. That is a detail in his biography that stays a bit in the shadow, but it was actually very important. You have to know that the governmental world, the academic world, and even the artistic world in Belgium, they were French-speaking. Even when I was, for example, a small boy, I heard a lot of French speaking with old in older generations, and these were the bourgeois people, the upper class of Ghent. Gislain made the link between the French world and the German romantic psychiatry, a move that was not seen a lot in academic world. One of his best intellectual friends was Willem Griesinger, also known of the, as the father of German biological school. He was in search of insight in the working of the human brain. Of course, only neuroanatomically, and what is also um, known of Griesinger is that he made a therapeutical turn at the end of his career and it became more and more clear for him that the real therapy in psychiatry had to do with talking cures and letting these uncurable people feel themselves as a human being. But German psychiatry, it had a long history to come. For example, with Kreplin, one of the most um, inspiring uh, figures of psychiatry of the 19th century and his books on uh, psychiatry exist in several editions. Each time the world of the institutional psychiatry looked forward to the new edition. He made the DSM avant la lettre. His thoughts were also mainly biologically orientated, but in his book we discover a passion or a fascination for what some of his, these patients of the clinic makes. For example, this, an almost uh, Jackson Pollock-like patchwork is one of the first examples of a reproduction of artistic world work in one of the books of Kreplin. It seems that Kreplin has uh, quite a big collection of art made by the inmates, and this example will be sent to an even more interesting figure in the history of psychiatry, Hans Prinshorn, who works under Karl Wilmans in this institute in Heidelberg. It is the psychiatric hospital of Heidelberg, where a lot of founding fathers of psychiatry studied and worked. And this Wilmans, he had two intelligent students that he wanted to give a special mission. The first was Prinshorn, on which I will come back later. Uh, Prinshorn, he studied medicine, became a psychiatrist, and later he studied art history. An interesting combination, I think, and Wilmans uh, liked it a lot, and he gave Prinshorn a special mission. The second student was a great intellectual and an enormous mind that was able to look for insights in fields no one dared to find insight in, namely psychiatry, Karl Jaspers. He became later a philosopher, 
uh, he discovered the uh, phenomenology during his studies and later become also the master of Anna Arendt, for example, and his weight in Western philosophy and psychiatry is big. Even today, we see a shift, a new shift to, towards the phenomenological psychiatry. He was a friend of Heidegger uh, until his uh, strange connection to the Nazi party in 1940. For psychiatry, Jaspers, his Allgemeine Psychopathologie was an important book in, in which he tried to cover psychiatry and all possible symptoms in a new theoretical uh, framework. He had an eye for even the art that is made by patients. And this book had several reprints and stands even today in a lot of libraries. Where Jasper's central idea was that it is important to see the form of specific symptoms, for example, the visual hallucinations. There were at the same time, a lot of thinkers in a complete opposite direction. And one of them, Sigmund Freud, is quite famous, I think. He was an opposite of Jasper's and had more interest in the content than in the form of the symptoms. His couch had a lot of inspiring people uh, that talked about what they see, what they hear, or what they dream and feel. The couch, the famous couch, is now on show in the British uh, Freud Museum. Um, and I will not go into the history of this contested theory, of course, it would take me too far. But for my story here, it is important to note that the talking cure Freud invented and that became widespread as psychoanalysis is a therapy, a theory and a cure that was made possible by the participation of his patients. Of course, it would be a bit too radical to name it participation as such, but the theory evolved because of the impact of the content of what the patients told to Freud. His movement spread in the Western world and far abroad, and in the 1930s, a political movement and governance was a real threat to this theory, where sexuality and other changing morals were crucial. In the 1930s, the Nazis ruled Europe and Europe and one of the lines in this political and autocratic empire was to get rid of all the degenerated people. This idea popped up in French and German psychiatry at the end of the 19th century, century already, and it became widely known through the works of, for example, Zola. Especially the avant-garde movements in the arts of the beginning of the 20th century were in the spotlights. Expressionists, Dadaists, surrealists, and all the other new arts were a danger for the German race. The, the only thing was to get rid of them. So they started an exhibition, the Entartete Kunst, and it was the most visited exhibition of the, nine, of the 20th century, with works of the Blaue Reiter, the German Expressionismus, were on show next to works of psychiatric patients, the collection of Hans Prinzel, for example. Kircher, Klee, Kandinsky, they were seen as degenerated art, and it was a proof that the new art was an art of fools and of madmen. This exhibition is an example of a dark page in Western psychiatry. And next to that, but I will not go further in detail, there was a wide extermination of psychiatric patients during the Second World War. This stays sometimes a bit uh, underestimated in uh, historical research, but the T4 program made it possible to kill a lot of these incurable and untermenschen. It will take some years for the world of psychiatry to recover and to find new paths. For my story, in the 1950s and 60s, this French psychoanalyst will take over and with a flamboyant but difficult speaker as Jacques Lacan, the psychiatric world, it changes. Language becomes, through the involvement of philosophy, a central part in the evolution of psychiatry. And we're heading for revolutionary times where philosophers like Guattari, Deleuze, their uh, 50th anniversary this year of Lantio-Deep, it, it was inspired by the communist theory and um, it stands central in the invention of the deinstitutional path, together with people like Tosca Yes and Jean Ri, and also the Belgian psychiatrist Jacques Schotte. In the beginning of the 1960s, the institutional psychotherapy comes in the picture. The major place for this new form of therapy was Laborde. 
This is a castle, a place where psychotic patients can go through their psychosis without any pharmaceutical help. This castle still exists, and again, it becomes more and more an inspiration for new directions in psychiatry, where the idea of destroying the institute is again uh, questioned. People like Jean Ri, the founding father, and in the institutional psychotherapy, where his club of patients was central. And until his death in uh, a couple of years ago, when he was in his 90s, he worked there as a psychiatrist. It was kind of a French answer to the, with Foucault to the anti-psychiatric movement that was rolling over the world of therapy and psychiatry, where people like Ronald Lane and others wanted to leave the classic institute and make madness a part of the normal world. Ling was and he is a contested figure, but he's more like the face of a revolutionary generation where people like Lautranger was part of. And with his schizo culture in 1975, he made a congress where theory, therapy, lived experience and the arts got finally hand in hand. For example, he invited thinkers like Foucault and Lang, but also writers like William Burroughs and more amazingly composers like John Cage and Philip Glass, who were part of the speakers. The Congress ended with a big schizo party where all speakers, students, scholars and patients could dance to crazy music of the Ramones and many more. It ended with a nervous breakdown for Lautranger and the schizo culture is not well known, but it's still an example of the search for including several voices in the debate on mental health. To this part, I want to give you a small sidekick with Fernand Deligny, because this French uh, pedagogue started in psychiatry during the Second World War. He went to bars of the resistant with his patients. He got them, these patients involved in an underground movement. Uh, the revolution was something that will be central in his entire life. Afterward, he had a short stay in La Borde, uh, but he felt all, even there he felt a resistant and uh, he wanted to start a new kind of non institute and he really wanted to escape La Borde. And he started a very revolutionary way of living together, for example, with Jean Marie, who was an autistic boy. It was handed over to him and who was told to be incurable. Jean-Marie, he couldn't speak. He was very difficult to communicate with or to have contact with. Him and some group of other incurable children were taken care of in the Savannah in the south of France, where they lived, like the, you can see here in camps, outside with these children. There were no therapeutic trained nurses, only youngsters that wanted to do something good in the world. Uh, more like hippie uh, living together of carpenters and workers who became caretakers. And they didn't really take care. No, they were just there next to these children in full search of how to be able to live together in a world without words. They made wandering maps. Maps that describe how children like Jean-Marie walked through the area. There were no walls or fences. There was only freedom. These are some examples of the uh, wandering lines of these uh, youngsters in the camps of Deligny. You can see sometimes you can see uh, pictures of the camp and sometimes it's more abstract. In October 21, we opened an exhibition. This is a picture of our exhibition with the films, with the maps, with the books and the biography of Deligny. Um, you, as you can see, it's a very solid and a straightforward presentation, not really a white cube, but a black box. Uh, and the black box was the circumstance, the environment, as to say, in the way uh, of Deligny. We try to incorporate his thinking in making of the exhibition, which was an, uh, uh, not, so diff not so easy to do. The environment looked like in the Savannah and the workers that were there made it possible to act with the children. Next to that, there was a tentative 
or an attempt in English where living or working together could find new inspiration in this exhibition hall where the pedagogue and the performing artist Simon Olemeers, he started an atelier. This environment become, became possible with the ideas of and dreams of children. Uh, psychiatry is nearby, uh, the building where our museum is located. The movement to radical participation was uh, crucial for the thinking patterns of our museum staff. Deligny opened our eyes, our ears, to see and to hear the voices of the people that psychiatry or the institute in general took care of. So actually, Deligny linked my history of psychiatry that is not the correct history, as you've seen. It's a personal and an institutional history where I kept some parts and important parts hidden. You haven't seen pharmaceuticals, for example, not if invention of the malaria treatment, electroshock or lobotomy. Uh, no, Deligny, he guided us to a new field and that is of the arts. How can arts become central in a museum on the history of psychiatry? But doesn't art has a long history in connection to madness with Van Gogh, for example, or Robert Schumann, the German composer who was in uh, psychiatric treatment several times. At the end of his life, he had severe auditive hallucinations and maybe a voice told him to jump into the Rhine. He was rescued, brought to a psychiatric institute where he lived completely isolated and died. Or maybe the less known Strindberg, a Swedish writer, a painter, photographer, also with severe mental breakdowns, and he lived completely isolated and in a very big depression. Another writer, unfortunately even less known, Gérard de Nerval. This French writer is actually famous because of his almost hallucinatory novels. He had several psychotic attacks and he stayed in several psychiatric hospitals. He is photographed here by the famous Nadar, was well known and an inspiration under a group of French novelists like Baudelaire, but all previous artists, they had severe psychiatric problems, but they were as well part of an art world. So there can be artists that aren't part of a mainstream world and why not? Let us look outside the mainstream art. And we come back to the beginning days of the 20th century psychiatry, where doctors were interested in the world of art. La Chile Fou by uh, Marcel Rija was maybe the first that wrote a little book on his own collection of art made by madman and madwoman. Of this collection, only a few pictures still exist. Most of the collection disappeared. And of course, the link with the primitive is most crucial and central. This handmade axes, for example, were made by a patient in an asylum. And there is, of course, a connection with the archaeological findings. It makes clear that these works are very primitive and cannot be seen as true art, but does it? Or a madman as an as a artist, a geisteskranker, as Kunstler, the first monograph of an artist from a psychiatric hospital, by Walter Morgenthaler, and this book is on the uh, this book is on an artist you see on the right part of the screen, Adolf Wilfley, who lived in complete isolation for 30 years in a cell of a psychiatric hospital. Morgenthaler and some of the nurses of the hospital gave Wilfley unprinted papers of journals and sometimes covering pens, so we can start to draw a parallel universe of a falling artist, Daufi, his alter ego. A Swissman that traveled across the entire world, got through a lot of adventures, while Wilfley himself, he stayed in his cell. These are two examples of his artistic oeuvre or his universe. All his work is unmistakably Wilfley. He really develops his own style, with a central figure, as you can see, Daufi. Wilfley couldn't read musical notes, but some of the drawings are full of music notes. Artists have tried to understand the sound that he heard. During his life, he had some exhibitions, but he never attended an exhibition of his own work. 
He was presented in a gallery in Paris, for example, near Montmartre, at the time, the place for artists like Pablo Picasso or, or Paul Klee. And these artists knew not only the specific artists, Wilfley, but uh, he was part of a growing and a more and more famous collection of Hans Prinzhorn, as I talked about earlier, who his research resulted in the Bildnerei der Geisteskranken, the artistry of the mentally ill, in which Prinzhorn searched for an understanding of the pathology by studying the works of these patients. A lot of artists in the wide world had a copy of the book in their library. Uh, for example, there exist pictures of Picasso holding a comp uh, copy of the book, and also Clay had this copy, or Jean Dubuffet, the French painter, painter I will be, uh, come later to. This book was full of pictures with works from the collection, the famous childish figures with heads like suns and only two feet, and of course the false symbols. But what was new in the publication was the place for colored pictures of work from the collection. Worlds that popped up from these papers were this, with the strangest architecture or writings that become complete figure fields, artists that found new ways for presenting their inner worlds and that inspired again the mainstream artists. Some of them, like Max Ernst, just stole ideas he discovered in the paintings he saw in the Princeton shows or in the books of Prince Princeton. Where artists like Paul Klee found new boundaries for the work he was evolving to. Klee is one of these artists that make real reference to the works of the Princeton collection, and he didn't steal the ideas, he just got inspired by them. In this mainly surrealist revolution, there was a painter, an important figure, Jean Dubuffet, who was a good friend of the French doctor André Breton, who worked in the field hospital during the terrible First World War, and who saw a lot of extreme injuries and traumatized soldiers. Together, they got inspired by works made by loners and uh, Jean Dubuffet, uh, his parents, they had a, a champagne there were champagne farmers and distributors, and the name Ar Brut is derived from the Champagne Brut, the unsweetened champagne. So you can say art without sugar, the true art or the Brut art. His idea of Ar Brut was actually more a concept of an artist that made a list of untrained artists that he loved. Uh, for example, the Brazilian psychiatrist Nisa da Salvera contacted him for examples to, uh, and presented them to him, a work of artists she thought would fit in this idea of art brut, but Dubuffet, he rejected. And after a quarrel with André Breton on the concept of art brut, he went his own way with the Compagnie de l'Art Brut, and it became a collection that can be seen uh, even today. I have two artists uh, that I think are really important. The first one is Ramirez. Ramirez was a trajaderos or a, a, a cowboy, a refugee from Mexico uh, who went to uh, search for a job in the, universe, uh, in the United States of America. Uh, there he was wandering uh, in the streets. Uh, he was completely uh, out of his mind. He was picked up. He couldn't pay his release, so he was sent to psychiatry for the rest of his life. And he never saw his family again. He stayed in psychiatric hospitals until his death, where he became famous of uh, drawings like these. Um, drawings where you can see horses and architecture that inspired him. Or the train and the trojadero or the um, cowboy that he... Um, identified himself, the train with which he went from one world of Mexico to another world in the United States. And in the 1950s, he already had his first, first exhibitions. Henry Darger, another uh, American artist, unfortunately didn't have any um, exhibition during his life. His work stayed closed in his uh, house, in his tiny apartment, where uh, the lives of uh, uh, the Vivian girls, you can see here, popped up uh, in a lot of adventures where they were uh, tortured and held by 
uh, grown-ups. Uh, there has been written a lot about uh, the work of Darger. And let me just give you one more picture of the Venice Biennale of a couple of years ago. Look at this installation of pieces of wood that are completely covered with textile. This, these strange creatures are the work of an American artist, Judith Scott. That she had Down syndrome, I don't think it should play a role, or does it? And that is the question a museum has to ask. If art is liberating uh, patients, why is it important to know the history of their sickness? Wasn't important to hear from me that Van Gogh was probably mad, that uh, Schumann suffered psychosis, or that even, for example, Lou Reed was cured in psychiatry with electroshock, or that the frontman of uh, Nirvana, Kurt Cobain, was a sufferer of severe depression. Does this tell you more about the work, or can the work stand almost completely for itself? so that visitors and spectators can find relief, rest or catharsis when they see art. But art can us also show other things. So can it help to find a new direction? For example, Javier Teles, uh, Argentinian artist, a contemporary artist, here in the right part in the still of his film. And he was raised in psychiatry. Uh, Teles, his two parents were psychiatrists, so as a little boy, he lived really in psychiatry. Uh, he visited us a couple of years ago in preparation of his major show in the Museum of Contemporary Art. He knows psychiatry very, very well, and all patients, they are actors in the story that he wants to tell. Or the art of the patients, they can be a carrier of a dialogue with the history they come from such as with this installation for the Prinzhorn collection in Heidelberg, where the sculptures from the collection are positioned next to the Ubermensch art of the Nazis. The work from psychiatry survived. The works of the Nazis, they are lost. Janet Cardiff is another inspiring artist for us. Uh, her permanent installation in Dusseldorf triggers us as a museum for many years. It feels like an attic. The attic we as a museum know very well you can see examples here you can hear parts of stories it all makes sense in one way or another but the sense you can have uh, you have to find it for yourself all is part of one bigger story a story that is not clear at the beginning and will be not clear at the end there is where our conceptual field pops in. With several museums with swollen or hard histories, we work together here in Flanders with the Red Star Line, a museum on refugees, or the In Flanders Field Museum, a museum on peace that is located in Wipers, a city that was completely destroyed during the First World War. Uh, many young men died on the battlefields in Belgium and France. It has an impact on our society even today. And this museum calls for, calls themselves an agonistic museum. They want to play a role in a debate on war and on peace. Caserne d'Orsain is the place where the Belgian Jews were taken to the concentration camps. It is a place of remembrance. It's a monument, but it's also a museum that is uh, working on genocides uh, worldwide today. It didn't stop with the genocide of the Jews, but they want to tell a more actual and a contemporary story. Africa is a museum, uh, museum is on our local colonial history in Belgium. It's the most difficult museum. The impact of the geopolitical, the historical, and the local of feelings and sentiments is uh, very big for a wide audience white Belgians that worked as colonists or black people that were refugees and came to Belgium. But the world of museums, they present some possible uh, solutions. For example, Richard Sandel or artists, Thomas Hirshhorn with his social practices, his Musée Precaire that he invented in the banlieues in Paris with uh, 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 people in uh, very social difficult situations and he makes uh, monuments the Gramsci monument for example in the um, in downtown in New York uh, where he 
makes monuments that disappear after a while and nothing exists of the uh, uh, exhibitions he made. Or Fred Wilson, an Afro-American artist who made Mining the Museum in Baltimore. And after he left, not only the collection or the presentation changed, but also the museum itself. So for us, it's important, as you can see, that the work of participation in the arts and heritage is growing, that the impact of the institutional histories is getting bigger and that curators have more activistic work. And in a museum, the activist attitudes is growing more and more. You can see, for example, also in the covers of the books of Sandel, first he started with representing disability. He's a, a physically disabled person, his, his person himself towards more about equality and social justice and ending in a more activist point of view to the outside world. In the end, can some pictures of our pre previous museum show you how we can change things? From a fake patient in a bath for bath therapy, this is a, a picture of a presentation we did 30 years ago with walls that only have educational impact to a more artistic environment but where the education and the history in a chronological way is still important or the reenactment is still crucial or where the lieu de mémoire, the a place of remembrance is a frozen place where it seems like psychiatry is gone and does only exist in the past. We can look at very few international examples like the Musea della Mente in Rome where the works of patient Nanetti is important, or the British Museum of the Mind in Bethlehem, where aspects of the historical psychiatry are crucial in the very modern presentation, to a museum of the mind in Amsterdam, where the two collections are completely separated. One, as you can see here, is the medical collection on psychiatry, and miles and miles further in uh, Amsterdam city, is the collection of the Arbrut or the outsider art. So a solution on the museum I cannot present. I can only hope that this story, these several layers and stories has given you an idea of how we think a museum in psychiatry can become more of a living museum and where the participation and the voices of the survivors can help us to talk or to see where we have to change the things and to make it possible to talk about the mental health. Only then maybe a museum can become a place on the history again, a history of a treatment that is lost and where institutes are equally parts of our society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bart. That this was um, how should I put it? There, there are so many threads that one could bring together. Not only about museums and psychiatry, but also mental health and art, and the work of um, the book of art, but also museums in addressing um, past traumas, and so therefore the place of the museum as a safe space to address um, social psychology, concerns of social psychology, etc. So very, very rich. Um, and I am I'm so grateful that you you gave us, uh, you know, th this kind of an oversight. Um, also, uh, you know, alluding to what it actually takes as cultural institutions to come together and address this in the society that one occupies, right? Like, so it's not simply about reflecting changing discourses on uh, on concerns like race, like uh, refugees, like um, colonialism, like the Holocaust, uh, et cetera, but um, actually a place that invokes it. And then at the same time, of course, pr provides, uh, provides a resolution is a bad word because this is never resolved, uh, but, but, a, but, a, but a path in a sense, right? Like a, like a moment of, of some kind of respite before moving on to continue to ask the harder questions. So thank you very much, for, very much for this. Um, I, I want to start, uh, you know, I'll, we have uh, audience here and on YouTube and I, and I, you know, we'll take questions now, but I want to start by, by asking you one question, which is how, one, how do you, but also what is your assessment of the audience responses to this, especially, you know, for those audiences who've seen 
the fake patient in the bathtub to others who see things, uh, so see other things that you're putting up now, right? So what is so so what is the changing reaction? But also what uh, how do your audience how does your audience respond to this at all? So can you tell us a little bit more about um, the the audience responses? Yes, thank you. That's an interesting question because uh, we have our new presentation, the one that I uh, walked through in uh, the afternoon, Unhinged. Uh, we, we gave it a title. We wanted to show and present to the public like this is a, a moment in time uh, and we will change the permanent exhibition or collection uh, a few times uh, every year, actually. Um, and it was difficult for the audience, even today, uh, because a lot of people, they uh, like or they need like the chronological, historical way of presenting a history of uh, psychiatry. Uh, it was strange to hear for us uh, at the opening of the exhibition that uh, some visitors uh, and to be really honest, some were actually mad and they wanted even their money back after visiting because they wanted to see the shock treatments and they wanted to see the, the torture. But in fact, we, uh, we, and we know that the torture and the shock treatments and, and etc. that was a part of the history, but we wanted to make an exhibition on psychiatry with historical objects that could respond to the question of uh, uh, people who are living in psychiatry for the moment. So they were involved in the entire process and they didn't want to show the big uh, uh, dormitories with all the beds and they didn't want to show the uh, torture or the um, uh, restraint uh, objects anymore. Mm. So it was difficult for the public. Yeah, I, I'm, it's, it's uh, yeah. Diffic difficult to deal with, de deal also with the change that, that you're proposing in a sense. I mean, you know, so um, another question that, that comes up is, you know, when you when you showed us the cover of Schizo and you told us about the history behind it, there seems to be between, there seems no, there, there is clearly a connection between the art world and the world of psychiatry and thinking about the mind. And, you know, I mean, you, uh, people like Lacan and others, um, you know, that, that you also brought into the discussion, there seems to be a, a vibrant exchange between these two, where there's a willingness to consider the mind considered mad as, um, you know, disordered in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, right? And that there's something, something to, to take from it, something to engage with and something to take very seriously. Do, do you see given that you're engaging with the art world, you know, for, uh, for the museum, um, do you see that, do you observe that that kind of an attitude continues or is there a change? Is there a shift from that? Is there a move away from that, for example? No, on the contrary. I think there is uh, there is even more and more uh, interest in uh, uh, with the uh, artists to uh, yeah, to get inspired by uh, psychiatry. Um, mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking uh, when you were uh, asking me this question, I have I, I'm trained by Paul Verhagen, and I don't know if he is uh, uh, if you know Paul Verhagen. He's a psychi uh, psychologist, a psychoanalyst here mm -hmm. in Ghent, uh, and the biggest lesson I learned from him was that. Every uh, symptom in psychiatry is like a creative solution to an, a problem that is uh, lying beneath. And I think this idea, it, it was for me during my career in the museum always so inspiring because indeed creativity can be... It, it's, I know it's hard to say, but even hearing voices is like uh, having a, it's a creative solution to an underlying traumatic uh, uh, problem. And I think this is uh, so inspiring for a museum and to, and it opens up so much uh, also on the, on the history. That is why, like, I know it was, I had a lot of names and it sometimes looked like name dropping and it wasn't intended to be a name dropping. But um, for me, all these figures like Watari or Uri or uh, Jaspers, they opened up uh, the mind in psychiatry and they went to art as well. And they had a, a, a really close connection with uh, artists. 
like the psychiatrist, uh, we have a, a very, uh, he was a close friend of Jacques Lacan and Jaspers, for example, mm -hmm. and he lived in Ghent. He's completely unknown in the world today. Uh, he died a couple of years ago, and he was a close friend of a lot of uh, painters and famous painters in, uh, in Belgium and in Europe. And there you also feel that there is a, a of such a close connection to the art because the art world can can open up uh, a, a debate or they can can make layers for a discussion on mental health uh, issues mm -hmm. do, do you think this is true of continental europe or do you think this is this is true more generally also well i know my story is always western because i uh, i think it's... no no no, no. So, so so no I, no i mean i even within the broad west as we understand it right like is this a continental yeah. european story or does the uk the united states australia also follow a similar trend i actually that is uh, uh, in europe we have uh, four museums on uh, history of psychiatry uh, in rome in amsterdam and in uh, london and there is not such a museum in uh, the United States. We have uh, visited visiting uh, professors during uh, the years who wanted to start an, uh, an, a museum on history of American uh, psychiatry, but I haven't heard of uh, any museum uh, in the United States, for example. But I think the connection between the art world and psychiatry, I, th I think there you see a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Okay, so no, that's good to know. Um, we are closing in on the time and I'm aware that we will be again taxing you with a, the with a tutorial session. So let me ask you the last question for the day from uh, one of our audience members who would like to know where does heredity configure in this, uh, you know, in the museum world, in the art world, in um, your understanding of psychiatry, health, etc. We've had a few historians uh, speak about it, in fact, and it would be great to know what your um, take on it is as well. But I didn't understand heredity. You mean the uh, in on uh, psychological, psychiatrical problems? You mean? Yeah. So where does where does the idea of heredity fit in the in the debate that is being or configured, or in the in the conceptualization of madness in the art world, for example? Does that even configure? Is that even a concern? Um, is that something people observe or not, or is that something that's just ignored? Oh, that's a difficult question. It's a very specific question. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, see any artist. Uh, there's no artist that is uh, coming to my mind who is uh, working on on that. Of course, heredity in general. Yes, you have. I, I know some artists who are working on 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 that idea from a biological uh, uh, view viewpoint, but not specifically on uh, psychiatry. And indeed, it's an uh, it's an interesting uh, field because I know that, uh, like we are, I, I told in the event this afternoon as well, we are preparing uh, an artist and science in residence program the coming years, uh, and uh, there. Heredity is always uh, one of the, uh, the the main topics, but uh, not really in uh, our presentation for the moment. We try to also to the the neuroscientist part of uh, the uh, the history of psychiatry. We have um, put this a bit aside because we wanted to focus on the institutional uh, history. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with our own institutional uh, history as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat, for an interesting evening. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And um, for those of you who are listening in, you're aware that the lecture will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to share it with your friends or check out the earlier lectures, which also dealt among other things with heredity, uh, but not necessarily in this context, do check out uh, the YouTube channel. Um, they, we have an upcoming lecture by the historian Leslie Top about when room becomes cell. Do consider attending that. Uh, explore our exhibit, The Asylum, uh, put together by Alok Sarin, Pratima Murthy and Sanjeev Jain. Of course, as always, do give us your feedback and um, we look forward to welcoming you to other events in the series. Um, join us tomorrow for all the events that I mentioned. And thank you again, Bart, 
for a very interesting lecture. All the names that dropped are floating like balloons in the air. So it's, 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 interesting, to, uh, it's interesting to make the connections and the associations. Thank you very much.